get into our message today. Uh, title of the message uh, that we're as we're going through, continuing through in our, our series here, it, it's called "It's Gonna Get Bumpy." It's gonna get bumpy. And the big idea of the message this morning is this: that tribulation is a part of the journey in the kingdom of God. That tribulation is a part of the journey in the kingdom of God. Now, I, I'm not a frequent flyer. Uh, I know that some of you maybe are. Some of you have to fly a lot for work. Um, but I'm grateful that I don't have to do that. I'm not a super awesome great flyer. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am completely amazed by it. Absolutely. The very fact that we can sit in a metal silo and be hurled at 550 miles an hour in the air while we sit and drink coffee, I think, is just pretty amazing. And the fact that I can fly to London in like 10 hours really is mind-blowing. Traveling from London to Vancouver 150 years ago would take months. People would die. People would be born. You may actually end up with a whole new group of people than when you started. Now I watch a couple of movies, have dinner, if I'm lucky, grab a nap, and I'm there. And so I think it's pretty amazing. But when the plane that I'm riding on starts to shake, starts to bounce around at 40,000 feet in the air, uh, I wonder at times about the wisdom of such travel. I remember being on a plane once and we started to bounce around a lot. I was on my way to Costa Rica. Uh, I was on an aisle seat trying to keep my Coke from spilling. And I remember as I was looking down the aisle, I thought, man, this looks like just in the movies just before the plane goes down. <laughs> and I know a couple of you have told me some of your plane stories. And uh, I can just say that I'm glad that I wasn't with you during that time. Uh, I have found, though, as I fly, when I fly, I have found great comfort. Uh, when the steward or the captain gets on the speaker and tells us before we hit a pocket of bad weather or turbulence, gets on the loudspeaker, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, in just a few minutes, we'll be coming up to some turbulence. It shouldn't last long, but for your safety, we ask that you would find your seat and buckle up. You see, I find great comfort in the fact that this did not catch them by surprise. They knew, they knew this was coming. They don't seem worried. And if you've ever been on a plane with lots of turbulence, you always sort of check out the steward, stewardess's faces, right, as they go running by. Are they worried? If they're not worried, okay, we can take a breath and we're okay. My mind rests, and I'm actually, when I see the calmness, hear the calmness, I'm not really bothered by it much at all. If the captain is not bothered, then why should I be? As we come to our text today, Paul, on his first missionary journey, he encounters some major life turbulence. And he speaks to it. And, and in many ways, he tells us the same thing that Jesus tells us more than once. That in this world, you will have trouble. You will have turbulence. Turbulence will be a part of the journey with Jesus. But you will make it to your destination. And there are times when life can get pretty bumpy. Maybe you find yourself in one of those moments today. And Paul, in our text, experiences it and speaks to it. And so with that, we're going to just quickly ask the Lord that we would be able to hear him today speak into our lives, and then we'll get into our text. So Father, as we come to this moment today, Lord, we, we thank you that you're going to speak to us. Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand and, and hear what you're saying into our lives. And so, Lord, we just commit this time to you for your purposes, for your glory, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we saw um, Saul receive Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah as we looked in Acts chapter 9. We saw him go from a, a man hunting Christians to a man proclaiming Jesus. We saw the direction of his life radically shift, radically change. And now, maybe 13, 14 years later, Paul sets off on his first missionary journey. After being appointed to this in Acts chapter 13 in the church of Antioch. The church of Antioch is located in Turkey, close to the Syrian border. And while they are there, they're fasting, they're praying, they're worshiping. And as they are, the Holy Spirit speaks to this, this group of people. 
and says, set aside for me Paul and Barnabas for the work that I have for them. It's time, Paul. We remember from last week in Acts chapter 9 when, when God was speaking to Ananias. And he says, he will see how much he has to suffer for my name's sake. And it's time, Paul. And so they lay their hands on Paul and Barnabas and they send them off to proclaim the good news of Jesus. <coughs> So off Paul and Barnabas set to share the gospel with both the Jews and the Gentiles. And Luke's recounting of this journey is quite a page turner, especially the story that we'll encounter today. And so I, I put together, I just showed a map. I don't know if the map is up there. Do you have that map? Who is up there? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. Nobody is up there. Okay, Olivia, do you got the map? Oh, yeah. There we go. We got it. Okay. Now, I didn't bring my pointer, unfortunately. My great pointer. But you can see up on the very right there, uh, where the blue and the red kind of come together, that's Antioch. That's where they were set off. And the blue kind of follows his journey, and then he turns around, and he comes all the way back. So that's basically the setup of his, of his first journey. Um, just so we can see where it was and what it was like. Now, Paul and Barnabas, when they uh, get to Iconium, uh, they share the gospel. But because of some very zealous Jews, they, they had to flee Iconium. They had a very successful time in Iconium sharing the gospel, but, but the Jews, they rose up against them. And they discover, Barnabas and Paul, they discover that the plan that these Jews had was actually to stone them. So they took off to the next place, which is Lystra. Whoa, here we go. <laughs> this is like a late show. It's fantastic. <laughs> Alright. So they take off, and they go to Lystra. They're running from the, the Jews in Iconium. They don't want to get stoned. And so they go to Lystra. And this is where we jump in to this first missionary journey. And you can see kind of where, I don't know if you can see it, but Iconium is in Galatia there, in that right in the center. Just down from it, just south from it, is Lystra. And so, <clears throat> this is where we jump into our, our journey in Acts chapter 14, starting in verse 8. It says, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And so Paul, after fleeing Iconium, does this, does not hide out for a few days. He doesn't let things calm down for a little while before he goes back on his journey. No, he just starts preaching in Lystra. And while he is preaching in Lystra, he sees this lame man. And this, and this event is very similar, actually, to Acts chapter 3, when Peter says to the lame man, we remember at the time of prayer going into the temple, he sees this lame man, he says, silver and gold have I done, but such as I have, I give unto you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And what that miracle does in Acts chapter 3 in a Jewish context is that it gives affirmation to the word that Peter will speak. And so when they see this man get up, he's been healed, they say, wow, obviously Peter has been sent by God, so we better listen to him. In this culture, in this context, it actually has quite a different response. The people were amazed, absolutely, but it did not cause them to listen more closely to Paul's words. Because of the context of this culture, it, it set them off actually in a very different direction completely. In verse 11, and when the crowds saw what Paul had done. Now, we know it was not Paul, but they didn't. Matter of fact, as we said, they have a completely different perspective altogether on what has just happened. So it says, that, and when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lycaonian, which is their own dialect, that Paul and Barnabas probably would not have understood. I'm sure they would have needed translators. But they said this in their own dialect of language. They said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And so they think that Paul and Barnabas are their own gods come down. In their minds, it did not affirm what Paul had actually been preaching. 
And the reason was that there was this legend in this area in Lystra that Zeus and Hermes had come down a long time ago. And they had disguised themselves as humans, as mere mortals. Then they went around asking for hospitality for people to take them in. But no one would. The legend says that Zeus and Hermes went to a thousand homes and not one person uh, let them in or showed them any type of hospitality. Until they came to this small beaten up shack where an elderly couple lived. And the couple welcomed them in. They put on a banquet for them, giving almost everything that they had. Now, remember, this couple did not know that they were entertaining Zeus and Hermes. And so as a result, Zeus and Hermes, they turned their, their small, humble shack of a home into a, a beautiful marble temple as a reward. <coughs> and the elderly couple, they had then asked to be turned into trees. And those trees were still around. They called these trees by their name. And then Zeus and Hermes destroyed, I think it was by a flood, the rest of the city. So this is the background to which they are perceiving what is happening. The legend playing in their minds. And then they witness this miracle where these two people are there. Well, you can imagine where their minds went. They're thinking, it's happening again. But this time, we're wiser. We will not mess it up. And maybe for their own self-protection of their city, we, we will not be destroyed this time. Verse 13, And the priest of Zeus whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the Apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of it, which I think probably took some time for them to fully understand what was going on, especially with the language barrier, they did all they could to stop what was about to happen. They came to, to point these people to the love of Jesus, not to point them to Zeus and Hermes. They tore their garments, it says, the scripture says, and then rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you. You know, when I started preaching regularly uh, Sunday afternoons, I actually found very difficult, very hard on me. And one of the things that I realized was that all week I had control of the message that I was going to share on Sunday. But as soon as I spoke it out, I lost all control of it. And it went into your ears. And I struggled because while I knew what I was saying and what I was intending to say, I struggled, however, with what people heard. Because as we will see, we all filter what we hear from our own context. And in all my years of preaching and speaking, even with translators, even in foreign countries, I have, I have never been this misunderstood. And Paul, he tries to tell them, we are not Zeus or Hermes, come down. That's not who we are. Goes on, the scripture says, and we bring you good news. That's what we're here to do. We're here to bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things. Our message is about turning from these idols, these gods that, that you have looked to but are actually not alive. They're simply gods that you have created. And, and then while our God, there are gods in our, our culture, they may look different. All of humanity, whether you're in the West or the East or wherever you are throughout time and space, all of humanity will serve something. And so Paul says, instead of looking to those things, look, he says, to a living God. Instead of a, a God of our making, look to the God who did the making. Who made the heaven and the earth, he says, and the sea and all that is in them. Paul does not speak to them of Old Testament prophecy like he does when he preaches in the synagogues. He does not speak of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, he, he doesn't speak using scripture verses, but rather he speaks on God's natural revelation to all of man. Creation. And it's important, I think, when we speak to people about the gospel to use language that makes sense to them as we watch Paul do time and time again. And so he continues to speak. He says in verse 16, In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. And he's saying in the past, God was extra gracious with the Gentiles. He knows that they didn't have the same opportunity as the Jews did to know how to follow God. 
However, this does not mean that it's a, a, a free-for-all. You have a revelation, a general revelation, maybe not a specific revelation, but a general revelation. And they would be held accountable to the revelation that they had received. As we said, it was not a free-for-all, which is often what it became. And they acted against the things that they knew to be true. As humans, we, we know certain things to be true based on natural revelation. We know that sacrificing children is not good. We know that. There's something intuitive inside of us. When you start moving and pushing these people, pushing beyond, beyond these, these barriers, there is an accountability in that. And they acted against the things that they knew to be true. And so there's still accountability, but not the same as it would be for the Jews. And so Paul, he carries on in verse 17. He says, yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with, with food and gladness. And so Paul uses this agricultural example here. Look, you guys, there was a revelation of God. You did know about some things. But this did very little to persuade the crowd. They were already in motion. Maybe in some ways they had already made up their mind on, on what they were going to do, what they had seen, what they had heard. In verse 18, even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Verse 19, but Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Now these Jews, they are very serious. They came from the places Paul had already been to try and stop them from preaching. They chased them to the next city. And in many ways, as I read it, it sounded a lot like Paul 14 years earlier. You remember as he was chasing the Christians, right? He was on the road to Damascus when he encountered Jesus. And so they, they go to work arguing away with the crowd. The scripture says, and having persuaded the crowds. And so somehow they persuaded the crowd that these guys were not Zeus and Hermes. And now the crowds think that maybe, possibly, they're thinking, these guys are imposters. Maybe they're even trying to pose as Zeus and Hermes. And most likely, this is all going on in a slightly different language that Paul and Barnabas cannot understand, so they can't even probably interject and correct anything. And so the crowds, they, they turn on them now. And it says that they, they stoned Paul, and they dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. And quite possibly, he was. Some scholars think that when Paul speaks of being caught up into heaven in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is the moment that he was speaking about. But we don't really know. Verse 20 says, But when the disciples gathered about him, he's lying there, the, the people from Lystra think that he is dead. Disciples gathered about him, and I'm sure that they were praying for him. Scripture says, And then he rose up, and he entered the city. He went right back into the city that just tried to kill him. I think I would have waited outside. I think I would have got someone to go get my stuff. You know, I'm like, can you go back in there and get my stuff? You know, I always thought that Paul would not like me. Um, I think that he would think I am way too soft, which compared to Paul, uh, let's face it, I am. And so he goes back into the city. And it says that on the next day, he went, to, went on with Barnabas to Derby. When I looked at the, this up, I was in the library this week, and I, I, when I looked this up, I was like, how, how far is Lister from Derby? Like, what are we talking about? And when I looked it up, man, I just started to laugh. He, he was left for dead yesterday. And then him and Barnabas, the next day, take off for a 120-kilometer walk to Derby. And of course he did, of course. I mean, you wouldn't want to, like, wait and kind of rest up a bit, maybe, somewhere else. Paul, I just thought, I kind of thought, man, Paul, you're a lunatic, man. You're just going for it. You're crazy. And you think about what happened to his body after being stoned. These weren't like little pebbles. They sort of flicked at him, right? He probably has like black eyes, maybe a broken nose, missing teeth, blood coming out of him. And he's walking this 120-kilometer walk to the next town. And he shows up. I mean, he's going to be in a really, really, really rough shape. Verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city, so he goes in his state, preaches the gospel in that city, and had made many disciples. 
And so Paul does not even stop. He just keeps right on going. This is according to God. And if that's not enough, after Derby, they go back. And so when it showed the map, you know, it showed the blue marks. And then they turn around and then they work their way all the way back on the red ones. And they work their way through. And so it says that they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. All those places that were against him trying to kill him. He could have went back home. He could have went back home and said, wow, that was one tough journey. But no, he goes back pretty close to the same route the way he came. Why? Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. He goes back to encourage them, to strengthen them, to say, hey, listen, keep going. But Paul, they might have said, you don't know how hard it is, what we have faced since you left. And he would say, he would return and say, yeah, I know. I know how hard it is, but listen, keep going. I'm going to keep going. You keep going. It's worth it. Paul will say in another letter, a letter to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, he says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. And so he tells these new converts, as he comes back through at the risk of his own life, keep going. He says, listen folks, you need to know this. And saying that, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Listen, he says, it's, it's going to suck sometimes. And it won't be easy. Living in the kingdom of God in this world will not be easy. He's not saying that we earn our salvation through suffering or we must suffer so we can get to heaven. No, what he is saying is the journey in the kingdom of God to the kingdom of God has a lot of struggle, a lot of tribulation. I think one of the biggest disservices that we can do ourselves is to think that we will not face suffering or that God owes me an easy life. Why should I have to walk through any of this suffering? Paul says to these guys, look, right now on this earth, let me just tell you, it's going to be tough. That doesn't mean that there is no joy, or that there is no peace, or that there is not beauty in the journey. All of these things are true, but so is tribulation. There will be challenges and suffering. This earth is not where we settle. We are here for a moment, a, a poof of time. James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. He says, well, what is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. For the Christian, it's tough now. But it will be fantastic later. As Paul said to the church in Corinth, it doesn't compare to how great it will be. In comparison, our suffering is kind of like a, a coolish breeze when you walk outside. A little chill. As you journey in the kingdom of God. And as you journey in the kingdom of God, I want to encourage you and challenge you to have a, a biblical perspective on this. Otherwise, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out why. And why is always the wrong question. The devil has a heyday with the why question. He will whisper lies in you, into your ears all day long. Why did this happen? See, God doesn't love you. That's why. God has abandoned you. That's why. You deserve it. That's why. And on and on he'll go until one sticks. And even if you land on one that is half good, it's not really satisfactory. God doesn't tell us 99.9% .9 of the time why. I think it will be clear in the end. But right now, through his word, he tells us 
Look, it's going to get bumpy. Put your seatbelt on. Verse 23, and when they had appointed elders from, from them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Well, many came to know Jesus during this missionary journey. And, and sometimes when we hear stories from pastors or missionaries, this is where, you know, it might stop. There's a lot of great, glorious stories that are shared. And we say, wow, that's, that's amazing. And we hear how successful it was. And maybe we can get the idea that, that serving God, if we do it right, is about one victory after another. That's not always the case. Because if you sat down for coffee with that missionary one-on-one, -on -one, you would discover that with every victory, there were some big struggles, tribulations, trials, suffering. And for Paul on this first journey, there was a great victory. But it was also a journey that was fraught with struggle, with trial, with tribulation, with suffering. And Paul, like a steward on a plane, relays to all the passengers, look, on this journey, we're going to hit some turbulence. So make sure to keep your seatbelt on. There's a quick few things that I'd like to just quickly touch on for a few minutes here on, on, on the idea of suffering and tribulation. And I want you to know that I don't come at this as some sort of expert. I mean, I think some of you could probably speak to this better than I could. But I do know that the Bible speaks to it, and so I'll do my best to share that. The first is that, as Paul says, tribulation is part of the journey. And one of the reasons that this is the case is because there is a spiritual battle. One of the things that we see as we watch Paul in this missionary journey and the message he presents is that the message presented is an affront to us as humans. By its very nature, there will be resistance to the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is wonderful when you're ready for it. But remember, the message is about a new king in your life. It's about a kingdom. And the problem is that as humans, we have a king already. And some of us like this king a lot. It's us. And so when a message comes of a new king, well, it seems like an attack on my own personal kingdom. And so we might fight back. The message of Jesus is often only received well when the Holy Spirit has re revealed the greatness of this kingdom and the direction of the kingdom we are presently living in. When he opens our eyes to the spiritual reality, it is often received. Come, <laughs> wow, this is way better. But if that's not happening, there will be a battle. And we see this. Those Jews that came after Paul, they were out for blood, and they got it. But there were those in Lystra, and Iconium, and Antioch, and Derby, who were ready, but not everybody was. And so they faced tribulation. And this is true for us. Some of the tribulation and suffering that we will face will be because of the battle between kingdoms that takes place. So that when we share Jesus, know that when you share Jesus, it might get bumpy. Sometimes the suffering we endure is caused by a spiritual battle. Secondly, something wonderful happens in tribulation, trial, and suffering. And my second point is that suffering and tribulation transforms us. There is something that happens to us when we walk in the valley that cannot happen in the mountaintop. There's a way of encountering Jesus that you can do nowhere else. Now, I'm not saying you should uh, desire suffering for this, because tribulation comes as a part of the journey, as Paul tells these new followers. But when you learn to trust God in the valley, there is something transformational about it. And if you've ever been in the valley and you've held on and you've clinged to Jesus, you know what I'm speaking about. Paul, when he was writing the book of Roman, uh, Romans in chapter 5, starting in verse 3, he says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Rejoice in our sufferings? What are you talking about? I mean, I know you were a bit crazy, Paul, but this seems like out of this world. But why would you tell us to rejoice in your suffering? Because they do something. He says we rejoice not because of the suffering, but because of the effect of the suffering. 
Scripture goes on saying, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit and has been given to us. The production of hope in our lives, he says, comes through suffering. And I also want to say, I think that the worst kind of suffering is suffering that doesn't change us. And that will be up to us how we deal with it. If you're suffering and you are just angry at God, that's not going to help you. That won't change you. That will not produce hope in you. However, if you're in the midst of suffering or tribulation, I mean, even today, maybe you're walking something through something today, don't miss what God wants to do in your life. This is where God takes your tribulation and suffering and makes something beautiful out of it. It doesn't mean that suffering is easy, but I will tell you, this is where God does some of his best transformational work in suffering. Don't miss it. There's nothing good about suffering if it doesn't change you. In the midst of your tribulation, say to the Lord, how do you want to use this in my life? Mold me, shape me, transform me, Lord. And I say every time that I have, I have done this, something shifts in my heart, something shifts in my mind, something shifts as I walk through the valley. And what seems like, like something should push me down actually produces something beautiful in my life. Thirdly and finally, I want to say this morning that there are times when suffering and tribulations, and I'm sure with these churches and these new Christians, as they were walking through this season, it seemed like it, maybe it was never going to end. They would just keep, keep persecuting, keep the tribulations kept coming. And there are times when suffering can seem like it goes on for a very, very long time. And at times there can be a weariness that, that goes with it. And so in the valley, my word to us is to keep moving. The only way through it is to keep moving. I remember speaking with a, a young adult maybe about a year ago, a couple years ago. They had been through a lot in their life. They had a lot of tribulations to work through, and they were, they were tired. I remember I spoke with them on the phone, and I said, listen, you've got to keep moving. Keep trusting Jesus. Keep holding on to Jesus. And they just said, you know what? I, I'm too tired to keep going anymore. I'm done. And they stopped. And as I, I didn't even know how to really respond on the phone, it was hard to hear. And when they stopped, some really rough things began to happen in their lives. They're back moving again, but it hasn't been easy. And if this is you this morning, I think really the only thing that we can do is to call out to the Lord knowing that we need to keep going. But we tell Him we're tired. Lord, you're going to have to carry me. And I really think that He does. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Out of the deepest, darkest valleys, He will lead you. This is why Paul went back, even when they could have come after him again. He risked his life to encourage them to keep moving. To keep trusting. In the midst of tribulation, trials, and suffering. Verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. This morning, if it's been a long fight for you, I want to encourage you. Keep going. Keep trusting. Don't pretend that it's easy when it's not. Don't stop asking for prayer. Don't stop calling out to God uh, in your own weariness. Tell Him, I'm tired. I don't think I can keep fighting. Fight for me, Lord. I can't. He will fight for you. And I know not only from the scripture talks about this, but, but in, my, in my own experience, this is true. More than once, I've thrown myself on the mercy of God and just said, you know, God, I cannot do it. I need you. And I just kept saying it. And as I was writing this, I was thinking, man, I wish that I could stand here and tell you that I'm one great spiritual champion and giant. 
Because you know me good well enough to know that I'm not. And that's not my role. My role is to tell you that Jesus can be trusted. Because when I couldn't, He could. And so my word to you this morning, if you're walking through that, is keep holding on. Holding on to Jesus. I'm going to invite our worship team to come at this time. We're going to sing one final song. The journey in the kingdom to the kingdom is bumpy. One of the things that he wants us to know, I think, from this passage that he wants to speak into us is that, that it won't, it's not going to be smooth sailing all the time. It's not going to be a smooth flight. It comes on to the speaker. Everybody that's on the plane, just want you to know as your captain speaking. Read the Bible. It's going to get bumpy. So sit down, buckle up. But we'll make it. We'll get to our final destination. You'll absolutely get to your destination, not because you can get there by your own will or strength, but because Jesus is the pilot taking us home. Lord, as we come to you today, Father, we acknowledge probably all of us here have walked through moments or are walking through moments even now that are difficult and are not easy. Some of it's a spiritual battle as we have presented the gospel to people. There has been pushback. Maybe there's been a loss of relationship even. Some of us have walked through different tribulations as we, we, we call out to you and hold on to you. Maybe for numerous other reasons. Some of us today are, are in the valley. And Lord, I pray that, that in that moment, that our choice would really to be to, to hold on to you to trust you, to call out to you, knowing that, that you will lead us, knowing that you can be trusted. Father, you, you have never let us down. You have never failed us. Lord, you have been faithful. We read about you in the scripture being faithful. You've been faithful in our lives in the past. You will be faithful in the present and you will be faithful in the future. And so Lord, we, we hold on to you now. I, I do pray for those that are walking through something just today. Be their strength. And thank you in Jesus' name.